The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Great. Can you hear me? All right. This is called Protect This House, Queen City Crowned. Um, there are uh, a couple parts of this presentation. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit about the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, a national and regional competition uh, where UNC Charlotte competes in yearly. I'm going to talk a little bit about leadership, uh, how it relates to com computer security, and some great stuff that happens during the conference. And halfway through, I'm going to hand it over to our Linux admin, Daniel Coulson, to go over how you leverage Linux in a defensive com uh, competition and how to make it effective. So a little bit about me. I'm a senior at UNC Charlotte, uh, majoring in software and information systems. I run the um, Computer Security and Ethical Hacking Club. A volunteer here in Charlotte on the ISSA board. Um, I'm a sysadmin uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I'm co-captain of the team, the competition team that you're going to see us hear us talk about today. Uh, just finished up an internship with Microsoft and do a lot. Uh, I'm a Windows admin, so I hope none of you guys hold that against me here. But um, our entire team comes from the club that we have at UNC Charlotte. It's our Computer Security and Ethical Hacking Club. Started in 2009 by eight or nine kids who just wanted more out of their classes um, as far as hacking and computer security went. Now we have over 100 members and we're the flagship organization of our college. We have the highest GPAs. We were nominated for Student Organization of the Year last year. Um, we handle um, anything from academics to social life to competition teams and we feed into not only federal agencies all over uh, but also corporate environments. So we've pretty much everywhere now. Um, the competition is pretty much billed as one of the most relevant computer security competitions um, out there today. This is not like your traditional ICTF, which is what most of you are probably familiar with. This is a defensive-based competition where the goal is to provide sort of a uh, business-like environment. And uh, they say that it's a year of IT's work pretty much put into 72 hours straight. Um, the teams here. Uh, just to talk a little bit about how it's set up is we uh, they're set up into different regions just like any other it sport. Will what? Okay. Um, essentially, uh, our region is the southeast, of course, and we travel to Kennesaw, Georgia, uh, every year to compete in our regional qualifiers. Uh, when you walk in the room, the teams all have identical network setups and. services are running, they're essentially green per se, but um, they're barely working. They're essentially hanging by a thread. There's malware all over the network. Things are terribly configured. Even some years we have physical, uh, physical vulnerabilities we have to find, like a rogue access point in the room, um, a ghost keylogger, a physical device installed on the system, and one year an ethernet cable actually mirroring every single uh, packet of traffic we had out to the red team. So I'm sure that was useful for them. I'm glad we found it pretty quickly. Um, we are scored in three different categories throughout the scope of the competition. Um, each category is worth 2,000 points. The uptime and business injections, and I'll talk more about the business injections later, um, all start at zero, and there's 2,000 possible points we can get out of each category. The defense, we start with 2,000 points, and then every time we're hacked, depending on how we're hacked, uh, points, are subtracted from, uh, points are subtracted from that as well. Um, the services we maintain are shared on both Windows and Linux systems. We have eight team members, and at the regional competition, we are against 10 schools. Um, so it all sounds pretty straightforward, except there's a catch. In fact, there's lots of catches. Uh, we're behind a proxied internet service. We get no sites uh, or any outside access to Google or anything like that except for written requests. So before the competition and during the competition, we request things like operating system updates, like uh, Ubuntu repositories, uh, Microsoft Windows update, download.com, 
essentially any resources we need have to be approved and we have to justify that. Um, the red team is incredible. Um, I'm not gonna do any name dropping up here, but these are professional penetration testers from all over the country and actually all over the world. And uh, essentially one, we have about one hour to get our ducks in a row and come up with some sort of recovery plan before the red team relentlessly starts hacking us and doesn't stop until 48 hours later. Um, nothing is out of scope for them. They're allowed to social engineer us. They DDoSed us for a while. Um, they inject malware on systems, uh, completely deleting systems. We'll go over a lot more what they've done later, but they are, they are intense and they are there to win as well. Um, the thing I think that separates this competition from uh, other computer security competitions are the business injections. They are quick, they are fast, they are all day long, and we never get a break from them. These are things that you see in your everyday job, assuming that you're a systems administrator. Stuff like implementing VPNs, DNSSEC, uh, wireless networking, keeping track of change logs, et cetera, et cetera. Even security assessments on our own network. And you know, the way we respond to them is, uh, importantly crucial, uh, is very important to the competition. So it's not just about, we need you to set this up, sh sh display your technical ability, and let's, let's go on from there. We actually have to respond with memos to the CIO, CEOs, and say, we have this set up, or we're not setting this up, this is a better idea, this is more secure. Have the user come by and get their credentials. So we are essentially running an IT company for a couple days. Um, C-level execs are pricks. Um, to elaborate on that, the people that run the competition are incredible, and they put a lot of work into it. However, during the competition, they are in character as a CEO or CIO, and they are there to frustrate us and distract us from um, every possible thing that you can. They are there to scrutinize us, and they're there to make sure that we are competing at the level that we should be. Uh, on top of that, a lot of the technology we're using is very outdated. Some stuff I've never even seen before. Some of it's broken. It doesn't even work in the first place. I didn't even know what BBS was until this past competition, and apparently it's pretty hard to lock down. Same as Server 2000. I don't know how anyone would protect against that, but I did not have a good time. Um, we have Junipers up there. So usually we get a network topology beforehand. Um, one of our younger students, um, we thought we were getting a Cisco ASA to monitor network traffic and block against stuff. So he spent about four weeks learning everything you possibly could about an ASA. And then we show up, and it's a Juniper uh, firewall. So he started to learn Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter um, as quick as he could, but that was pretty frustrating. Um, like I was going over earlier, this is all about our response to things. We have to be professional. Um, this is not a rack and sack kind of hacking competition where you're throwing everything you can at something. This is a lot based on what you see in a business environment. So uh, we have to document everything we do. This is either through change logs and documentation. We actually have an entire person dedicated only to doing paperwork. Um, whether it's the red team or the white team or even at SECCDC, the power completely shutting off during the competition for a couple hours. Um, distractions are constant. This includes them saying memos where your team captain is sick and has to leave the room for an hour. Um, having to go to meetings, red team running in your room and taunting you and making you feel infinitely small. Um, doing paperwork, documentation, all of that is a distraction for what we're doing technically during the competition. On the national level, these are the nine, uh, ten regional winners compete, and these are nine of them here. Um, there's nine. We're missing one. Thank you, person I asked to say that. We'll go over that in a minute. Uh, is anybody alumni from these schools? We got Air Force Academy, Alaska Fairbanks, RIT. Do uh, we have any alumni? Good. We don't like those people. The tenth regional winner is, of course, us, UNC Charlotte. At the SECCDC this year, we were awarded first place, and not only that, we were awarded the best in defense and best in uptime. This is my favorite picture from the competition tweeted by the director. Uh, for anyone that knows, this is Nagios, an overlay checking on the services that we maintain during the competition. That ranges from everything from Active Directory, DNS, uh, multiple Linux websites, e-commerce. Um, so this is monitoring our services. Red is obviously a bad thing. Uh, if you'll notice, the top right is the only one that's completely green. That's the end of the competition, and that is UNC Charlotte. The rest of those people have gotten pretty well hacked, it looks like. So, <laughs> This is the topology that we deal with during the competition. Um, we have workstations, just like you would in a corporate environment. Um, some of them running Windows XP, some of them Vista. 
some of them 7, some of them Windows 2000. Um, and we maintain multiple services. Uh, we have a website running on Windows IIS. We have Linux database, MySQL, uh, an e-commerce server. Uh, we have a Linux secondary DNS, a Windows Active Directory, DNS, DHCP server, uh, Windows email server as well. Uh, this is what we are ch charged to maintain during the competition, and we do it with a certain structure for our team. Uh, this is kind of a breakdown of what we have for our eight members. We have a captain focusing on business injects and um, all their professional courtesies to the CIO, CSO during the competition. We have a co-captain who happened, this is me, who happened to be the Windows admin at the time. We have two Linux admins, a backup Windows person, uh, the memo, someone dedicated only to paperwork, uh, a network person, and a gopher, basically to handle anything and everything that we don't have time to do during the competition. So with that being said, um, we have kind of tailored this presentation to meet the Southeast Linux Fest, and I'd like to introduce uh, our uh, Linux admin, Daniel Coulson. He's 19 years old, kind of like half of our team. We have a very young team right now. He's an incredible asset we have, and he's going to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes on how Linux is used during the competition, successes, failures, working with weird technology. So, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about the Linux business injections. And uh, we had various things like setting up a intrusion detection system, setting up an FTP server, which was a trick question. We were expected to push back on that since FTP is not secure. We instead set up an SFTP system for them. We also had to add or remove users from the systems or websites. Um, at one point, we even had to set up a honeypot. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't know how to set it up at the time and didn't have time to learn it. So it ended up grabbing all the IP addresses on the network temporarily until we took it back down. Needless to say, that took down all our services. So, uh, and all these were directives from the CIO as memos. And they're continuously coming in. This is just a small sampling. Um, some differences between the regional and national level competitions. At regionals, uh, we only had two Linux workstations and three Linux servers and two Linux admins. So not too much there. We just took care of a workstation and kind of shared the servers. At nationals, we had a very large network for two Linux admins at least. There were two Linux laptops, eight servers. The, um, so this, this was quite a bit more than we could reasonably handle. Um, and there were more exotic local attacks. Once they got in, they would do, put more backdoors on, get trickier um, local things that we couldn't find. Uh, lots of remote attacks. They were hard to defeat. Uh, and there was some of that at regionals as well. But compared to nationals, regionals was a little easier though definitely not easy. Business injections were, again, more difficult at nationals, but there was approximately the same amount within periods of time. Some misconfigurations we encountered when we walked into the room. Uh, our, we had a Gentoo box, which was set with very low resolutions, probably about 800 by 600 or maybe lower, with a very hard to read font. Luke, our other Linux admin, worked on that. I don't know quite how he did that. <laughs> the, our Ubuntu box failed after a distro, dist upgrade. It was version 8.04. So we wanted to upgrade that. And after it rebooted, it failed. So we eventually had to download with unit boot in a live USB, boot from that. That was the workstation I was working on. However, it didn't have the correct graphics drivers, so I was using the command line the entire time. No GUI. There was default passwords on everything from the workstations, the servers, even the router. Uh, there was a publicly accessible PHP MyAdmin page. Again, default password there. Unhelpful command aliases. Uh, things like the CD command were alias to shutdown-h now. <laughs> so <laughs> as soon as you tried to go anywhere, 
the system would shut down unless you noticed that first. And sometimes they had even made backups of, the, of those aliases. So if you remove the alias that you saw first, there would be another one included in the bash RC file. <laughs> so it would come back. Key loggers, Linux key logger, LKL was there occasionally. Um, there were others that we simply couldn't find. But, and there were no firewalls in anything. Red team, some of the things they did to us. Web server brute forcing. We figured they were using a tool like Durbuster to uh, just try to brute force paths on the web server, see if anything was open that we think could get to. Once the, when they got in on an unpatched system that we hadn't had time to patch yet, they added their own SSH keys. So even if we had changed the passwords and stuff, locked it down, they could still have gotten in. Uh, and that box actually was repeatedly hacked. They kept changing the root password and stuff. So we eventually just took it down, went through it, and found those SSH keys. They also, as Zach mentioned, they DDoS the web server with uh, HPing3 using an SYN packet flood from randomized IP addresses. So we couldn't just say, oh, this is the IP address that's coming in on block. So what we did there actually was we wrote a script to look through Netstat, pull out the IP addresses that were flooding us with SYN packets, and dynamically add IP tables, firewall rules to that. And surprisingly, it worked. And we were actually the only team successfully defeated that. They, as I mentioned, they changed the root passwords. Uh, once they would get in, they would change things, uh, shut down services, and change root passwords, which we'd have to take the systems down to single user mode, change the root password back, and figure out how they got in. Though on virtual machines, we could occasionally re-snapshot them back. PHP web back backdoors and web shells on the web server. Some of these were helpfully named backdoor.php, and things like that. Um, some of them were not so obvious also. More red team. They ran an rm-rf on our entire web server and took the whole thing down. Fortunately, we did have a image from the beginning of the competition and eventually we were able to put that back on there. This is not a virtual machine, by the way, so we couldn't just re-snapshot it. Um, Probably my favorite, and least favorite, of course, um, thing they did was an MBR virus. So once they got in and we saw a script going that quickly downloaded an executable, about 10 seconds later, the system rebooted, and the master boot record had been overwritten and edited so that when it displayed, it would say, display the message, this box has been pwned by Mookie. Please contact Best Buy Technical Support for assistance. So that was quite interesting. Fortunately, that was a virtual machine. We were able to re-snapshot it back and try to fix it. They dumped our MySQL databases. We had customer databases that we were supposed to protect. And we didn't always. <laughs> this was, again, able to get, they were able to get in sometimes before we were able to patch the systems. For example, in the regional competition where we had a proxy server there, um, the Debian security updates were not in the list. And we were not able to get those until the second day. So they also, at Nationals, again, there was a lot of stuff at Nationals that was more exotic, sort of, that we had never seen before. None of our team really had any experience at Nationals before. So they had infected system services. Um, we never found any of these, but they apparently had infected some of the system services, so something that was valid, a valid service running, was itself infected, and so there were no random executables lying around, cron jobs, et cetera, that they were using that. They replaced system executables, um, chmod, chown, things like that, and replaced those with their own malicious versions. They would... <laughs> This was another interesting trick. They would add users to Etsy passwd, then set the immutable bit and delete the change attribute executable. So we couldn't change it back. We had to eventually find that package and reinstall that so we could remove the immutable bit and remove those people. And on our Solaris mail server, they executed a fork bomb 
which continuously spawn hundreds of bash shells. So, so what we did for our defense, we used very long passphrases, 20 to 25 characters, something like that. And near the beginning, we occasionally used a temporary human IDS. There's people watching NetStat for incoming uh, SSH connections and stuff that shouldn't be there. Database permissions, we would go in and change the passwords on everything there, including the MySQL databases, and try to restrict some of the permissions on the database so that if they did get in, they wouldn't be able to do a lot. IP tables firewall, this was interesting. Uh, before the competition, we had printed off some reference manuals and stuff for IP tables, common commands and stuff we figured we need, and it wasn't enough. We did not know IP tables good enough, and we had to learn it very fast. So we will be using, we know IP tables better now, but we will also be using UFW to help with firewall rules next time as well. And of course, we performed security updates when we got them. More defense, again, the script that dynamically adds IP tables rules to defeat the SYN flood. And another helpful tool we wrote on the fly there, a small system monitoring script that would look through Apache logs, var log messages, database logs, whatever was on, relevant on that server, and to display that on the screen, it refreshed every five seconds. It also showed incoming NetStack connections, like SSH. Um, so that was part of our human IDS there. That was very helpful. Um, and toward the end of the competition, when we did get our firewall rules good, they weren't getting through anymore, and we kept seeing failed SSH logins on there. So recovering from attack. This is the method we used when we discovered a system had been compromised. And we really started doing this at regionals after that server with the SSH keys on it had been broken into repeatedly. And since we weren't able to do the security updates, that's probably how they got in. Um, so first step there, figure out how they got in. We just kept going through PassWD and running RK Hunter, my new favorite tool. Um, check, we finally checked the SSH authorized keys and found their extra keys figure out what they did when they got in, second step there, find the SSH keys. Third thing, fix what they did, patch the hole. We had, we removed the keys, made sure the firewall was in operation, which is also part of make sure they don't get in again. So this is the procedure we repeated on systems when we couldn't, or when they were compromised. And I think that's what really helped us at regionals especially. How we could do better. We did good, we won regionals, but we could definitely do better there and at nationals. IP tables, again, we didn't know the syntax very well from the beginning. Uh, multiple OSs, we had, had regionals, there were some fairly normal things there, Fedora, um, OpenSUSE, Ubuntu, things like, Ubuntu, things like that. At nationals, they had all, the, all those as well as FreeBSD and I think OpenBSD and Solaris. So we didn't know Solaris or BSD really well. We knew BSD good enough to put up a firewall and install packages, or run RK Hunter, things like that. We weren't able to stop the fork bomb on Solaris though. Local hacking prevention. Once they got in, we needed a way to keep them from being able to do too much. So something like SE Linux, we didn't have time to get that up. Um, we're possibly looking into things like GR security, something that doesn't have quite as deep a learning curve. Database security, I mentioned we tried to lock down the databases some, and we could do a little bit of that, but we didn't know a lot of how to do that. We're also working on learning methods of detecting and recovering from attacks like we faced at nationals, where there's uh, executables, malicious executables embedded in the system services, and where they replace executables of their own the red team told us at the end that within the first 10 minutes of Nationals competition there, they had at least five backdoors on all systems. So we really need to keep them from doing much since they're already in there. And like I said, we didn't have a lot of time during this. So if we wanted to set up an IDS, then by the time we could have done it, 
they would have been into everything and the IDS would have been moot then. And what we're working on for next time, quickly setting up those firewalls with UFW or a pre-worked um, pre out firewall script with IP tables, learning multiple OSs, cross-training team members. We only, again, we only had two Linux admins, which was fine for regionals, but for nationals we needed two and a half or three. So we're going to work on train, cross-training some of the Windows guys to work on Linux a little bit, or even pulling in a third Linux guy. Um, and us Linux guys can also do some things on Windows as well. If our, you know, as our team captain needs to step out of the room because he's sick, then we, one of us might have to step, in, step up and do something there. Um, web and database permissions. Again, we need to work on securing SQL databases so they can't do much if they get in and SE Linux. And back to the Mayo. All right, so that's pretty much the scope of Linux and how it's used during the competition. Although we had two Linux admins, um, both of them were 18, 19 years old, so I think they did. They definitely held their own at a regional and a national level, and we're very, very proud of the accomplishments that they've had there. Um, this, co this, uh, this competition is designed to frustrate and overwhelm, so a lot, of, a lot of what we had to do there is work on our leadership and teamwork. I think this is something uh, I want to go over a little bit about kind of what we do there and a little why it's different. All of us obviously deal with this if you work with other employees, whether you are uh, the leader or just a part of the team, it's different with IT people. Um, I'm the one of the classically leadership trained um, sort of how people work together in committees or small groups. And what I've noticed is it doesn't work as well or sometimes at all with people that are very technology minded. Um, we are different than most people. And by that sense, in small groups, uh, the ways that we communicate and the ways that we're inspired are different as well. Um, you know, introverts, maybe odd self-confidence or perhaps more self-confidence, um, highly intelligent, they require a different kind of stimuli to keep entertained in that kind of situation. Um, if I interviewed everyone in this room and asked them what a great leader was and what they saw in great leaders, everyone would obviously give me a different answer. There'd be a couple common, uh, a couple common answers between you all, but everything, uh, for the most part, would in fact be a little different. And by that respect, a different leader should be a different leader to different members of the group. Um, I think if you interviewed the team members of a group, they should say that a good leader actually has, um, that their leader was in fact different people to them depending on the situation, and they would all give a different opinion on what they did that was most effective. Um, I put up there, technical ability is important, respect is more important. This is sort of uh, way more relevant in sort of a competition setting we, where we are extremely overwhelmed and in the weeds. You need to be able to trust your leader on a technical, on a technical basis, but also sort of an organizational standpoint to say, uh, everyone, you know, this is what we need to do to get out of the situation. We all need to work together and inspire each other to move through the process. Um, I put the word Ubuntu up there, and it's probably not what you're thinking it is the amazing operating system that it is. But Ubuntu, one of the translations for it is actually, I am what I am because of who we all are. And in its, in its very team-based setting, I think it's important to keep remembering that. Um, you know, I asked earlier if everyone would say different qualities about what a great leader would be, but so why would you adopt the same style when dealing with different kinds of people? Every single member of my team, and I assume your team, responds differently to different actions. So by that merit, I think it's important that inspiration is met by different stimuli. You know, even, for example, hearing me talk and hearing uh, Mr. Colson talk for a certain amount of time, on our team, you would influence us differently and inspire us differently um, for c the complete effectiveness there. Um, I think great teamwork comes from practice. That's something that we have practiced a lot. Everyone on the team has known each other for years, and that really comes out in the competition setting. If you don't put any work towards becoming a great team, then you'll all just be a lot of people working separately towards the same goal. And I don't think that's very effective. But 
Uh, by that same merit, um, we, did re won, we did win regionals, and we didn't do as well as we'd like at nationals, but we will, of course, be back next year, hopefully with a vengeance. But that's not to say that we don't have a little bit of humility as well. So I'm going to go over a little bit of some sad and funny stories that we experienced and that I think you'll all appreciate. Um, we talked a lot about how evil the red team is. And while we appreciate the um, volunteering, um, it was pretty rough during the competition. They would, uh, they would make certain teams, this didn't happen to us at Nationals, but they would make them tweet a picture to, picture to National CCDC of all of them basically fake crying. And if they did, then they got 30 minutes without getting hacked. Um, Daniel uh, mentioned the Best Buy boot sector. A lot of the red team, I think, were writing 9cat to the boot sector. So instead of an operating system, it's got a picture of the 9cat meme. Uh, while you were booting. Uh, this was from two years ago, one of my favorites. The red team was hacking and defacing websites, except they felt, felt so bad for the team they were attacking, they actually defaced it with instructions on how to not let it happen again. I think uh, <laughs> they just wanted a challenge. Um, a lot of times, you know, you're going through systems, and I guess this isn't more Linux related than Windows of something I've seen. You know, red team a lot of the time, and this is more true at nationals, when they're in, a lot of them, yes, will RMRF everything and shut down and uninstall DNS and change everything. Some of them don't do anything. They just get a shell. You know, if they retrieve personally identifiable information um, or if they retrieve, depending on what they retrieve, they get more points. So you don't always get the most points as a red team from just destroying everything. So when I'm on a Windows system and I see notepad.exe running with, like, I don't know, a gig of memory behind it, pretty sure that's a process I'm going to end immediately. Um, at Nationals, actually, I had a scheduled process running every minute to send a shell back to the red team. So, and I couldn't remove it because they changed any permission I'd ever have, just like the immutable file um, process, I think. So I actually had to create a scheduled task that was triggered by that task to kill the shell to give me even five minutes of relaxation during the competition for that particular Windows 2003 box. Um, he went over remapping commands, CD shutdown. One year it actually opened the CD drive, so I thought that was pretty clever. Um, let's see here. 47, I'm a sad panda. That entire line is part of one of our passwords. Um, this happened, the reason I put that on here, uh, so during our DDoSing and our hazing last year, uh, we're down and essentially one of the directors of the red team that we knew and we had always talked to throughout the years runs in our room and yells at us, sad panda. And we're like, oh, that guy's a jerk, whatever. Then he leaves, uh, and I think our team captain, a couple minutes later, was like, oh my god, that's the root password to our intrusion detection system. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that is a classic red team move. I mean, it's happened before. So, um, essentially, when you get hacked, uh, at CCDC, it's, it's not, of course you've heard, it's not if you're going to get hacked, it's when. Well, CCDC. It's not really when, it's all the time. So it's what you're going to do when it happens. So every time we get hacked, if we do an incident report and we do it correctly, we receive half the points back that happened for that attack. So we went through the logs and we looked for everything we could um, and we filled out an incident report. Director of the hackers, you know, came in and yelled our root password to the entire team and then left. And we had no idea how they did it. We couldn't check anything. So after the competition, I remember talking to him and I went up to him and I said, so I, I found everything, you know, we found so much that you did, but we couldn't find the IDS thing. How did you get our root password? He goes, what are you talking about? And I said, you yelled sad panda. That was one of our passwords. He goes, no, I just say sad panda all the time. So it turned out to just be a complete coincidence. So um, we quit using memes as passwords and have moved on to SpongeBob SquarePants. We'll have to find something else for next year. Um, hazmat suits. As I've said multiple times, this, uh, this competition is meant to overwhelm. There's a lot of other things besides technical proficiency going on in the room. Uh, two years ago, we walked in the room and there's a box of hazmat suits in the back. And they're actually just painter suits, but they were built as hazmat suits. And I think they were built for a person that was about four feet tall. So I don't know where they got them, but there was a lot of emergency response. There was an emergency response plan that we had to be ready for and read through the, bullet the bulletins and whatnot. Um, so at some point, they ring an alarm, and apparently there's a hazardous material spill in our building. I guess it would be a situation that you would run into if you worked at IT security at some high military base or whatever, but you essentially had a minute to put on your hazmat suit. 
And some of us that, you know, are not this big or we're having trouble with it. Um, so they, if you didn't get your hazmat suit on the time, you were infected and you have to leave the room for an hour. So that was one of my darkest moments was being kicked out of the room where I had hours and hours of work to do, sitting outside in the rain alone in a hazmat suit. That was pretty depressing. Um, RDP battle over Active Directory. So this is one in time that I was really thankful that the guy that was hacking me was so good at Linux and so terrible at Windows. Um, he, uh, I believe, before we had updates, he did a pass the hash attack on my domain administrator account. And actually, even before that, when we were outside talking, he, he told me that he had my domain admin account, or he, he at least used the, knew the username. And he didn't even know my name, and he goes, yeah, what's, that's, that's, what's Zach Admin? And I was like, oh my god, so I had to change that up real quick. But at some point, he did a pass the hash attack on my account, and he sh locked me out of my domain controller, deleted any other account for me to actually get into the domain controller, and then locked me out of my workstation that I was working on to access the domain controller in the first place. So I essentially have to hack back into my own workstation. And it takes a couple minutes for me to basically get in with an account that's not a domain admin and escalate my privileges up to where I can see what he's doing. Finally, you're getting control of my own account, and he's sitting there not using Active Directory how you're supposed to and trying to uninstall DNS. So his, uh, his not knowing how to shut down my domain bought me a couple minutes for me to hack my way back in before he destroyed my entire network. Um, why are we yelling at each other? This is just something silly. You know, when a lot of communication, and this goes into the next point too, where not to put software. The memo guy is one of the most underappreciated people during the competition. You cannot win, you cannot even compete without doing paperwork. So the memo guy, it's important to communicate with him at all times. So what we're trying to do during the competition is document what we're doing, and he's working on either remediation from us getting hacked, or he's working on change logs, or he's working on a business injection response. So I'm yelling at him at one point, and we realize we're talking about the same thing, and there's no reason to yell at each other. But the where not to put software, the, uh, the CIO of the competition, who of course is in character as you know, a hard ass at the time, comes in our room, and he goes, team captain, come down here now. Stop everything. So you know, you kind of walk down there, tail between your legs. And he, uh, he told me, I don't know where you're putting software, but you need to quit. You need to stop it right now. And he hands me a memo that we wrote, which was a URL request. And apparently our memo guy at the time wasn't very proficient with Linux, because when I read it, it says, uh, we would like to request the Ubuntu suppositories for updates. <laughs> so. Not repositories, but suppositories. So clearly, we have rectified that in every sense of the word since that happened. But um, that was pretty challenging, and we got haze for that. They used to make us wear cheese heads when we'd do something stupid and take a picture. They're uh, all about the hazing there. Um, but that's, that's all we've got for now. That's some of, the, uh, some of the humor we use to try to keep sane during the competition. Um, we would love any of you guys to come volunteer or come hack us on our test networks or offer any kind of training. Uh, obviously, we're nonprofit. We're an organization university, um, or within the university, rather. So um, any kind of contact or any support, any feedback would be absolutely fantastic. Or if you just want to stay in touch, here's my contact information. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think we have a little bit of time left. Yes. So one of the curveballs that they oh he asked if they were used that if the he said they used VoIP systems at nationals and asked if we had encountered that we had and there were a couple of teams that got hacked through that we did not um, although you know I said that we were scored on three categories at regionals the fourth category that they added at nationals this year was essentially customer service so we had an orange team essentially the, our customers we were running their websites calling, pretty much prank calling us every hour and distracting us as well. Um, there's a meme online I encourage you to look at called Blue Team Bird, which essentially is all the stupid stuff that happens to the blue team and mistakes they made. And one of, uh, one of them, and I don't know which team it was, but apparently the red team had changed their caller ID to the black team, which as far as I know is not a team at all. And they were calling and asking for root passwords to systems. The red team was calling them. Um, and going in through there, but yeah, we had a VoIP system. It was 
uh, we never got hacked on it, but I know a couple teams did. Any other questions? I think Black Team is the build team. I think Black Team is the build team. I saw one blue team bird that apparently the red team or the white team had a quadcopter with like a camera on it or something. They were flying into teams' rooms. And apparently one of the kids tried to use a Cisco ASA 5505 uh, or whatever it's called to bat the quadcopter out of the air. So yeah, they pretty much do everything they can to distract you during that, <laughs> including aerial video surveillance. So we had one year, we, um, I think I was the captain at this point, we had uh, someone in a Kennesaw, we, it, the, the competition happens at Kennesaw State in Georgia. We had someone in a Kennesaw polo come up to us and say, we're doing some blasting outside. Uh, we need to take pictures of your room. So of course we are on paranoid, like DEFCON 5 alert level. So I'm like, absolutely not. Get the hell out of here, red team, you know, trying to see what we're doing. And uh, we even put an incident report and I asked one of the administrators of the competition later, I'm like, yeah, that was pretty sly. And he goes like, no, those people work there. You probably should have let them in the room. <laughs> but, you know, no harm, no foul, I guess. So, any other questions? All right, well, you know, we are your sports team. If you can't count on the Panthers, hopefully count on us to do well for you. And uh, <laughs> we appreciate you letting us come here and talking about our successes and our failures. And, yeah, it's great to be a part of it. All right. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. 
lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well-stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.